For more than 20 centuries, scientists have studied the Earth's nearest neighbor, a mere quarter of a million miles away, seeking to unlock the secrets of the solar system. Folklore associated with the moon is really rich and varied, and even though we've walked upon the surface of it, we still speak sometimes of the moon being made of green cheese. And we still fit it into our popular songs, sometimes with romantic notions about the light of the silvery moon or the harvest moon, sometimes speaking of blue moon or paper moon. And we look off at the face of the moon from here on the earth, and we see a face looking back to us, the so-called man in the moon. Well, in the 17th century, Galileo pointed his telescopes up toward that face and discovered that it was really composed of the mountains and the ridges, the valleys and basins and craters that make up the real face of the moon. And that, in turn, gave us our first scientific understanding of that other world, that closest world in space. Galileo Galilei was the first scientist to use the telescope a quite novel instrument at the time, to study the moon. He wrote, I feel sure that the surface of the moon is not perfectly smooth, free from any qualities and exactly spherical as a large school of philosophers considers. On the contrary, it is full of inequalities, uneven, full of hollows and protuberances, like the surface of the Earth itself. Galileo's discoveries overturned erroneous beliefs which had been held for some 14 centuries and laid the foundation for modern lunar science. Galileo would be followed by a stream of other scientists and a mass of new information and knowledge. The centuries of investigation produced a great deal of information about the moon. For instance, the moon orbiting once about every four weeks with the same face always toward the Earth, is far larger compared to its planet than all but one of the other moons in the solar system compared to their planets. In fact, the Earth and Moon are considered by many to be double planets. And some scientists believe that the Moon is gradually pulling away from the Earth, which in turn is gradually revolving slower and slower on its axis. There is at least some evidence that the moon was much nearer the Earth in the very distant past, although no one knows just how near it might have been. The surface of the moon has been described as a cosmic battlefield, a place terribly hostile to life. It is alternately baked and frozen at temperatures ranging from some 120 degrees centigrade above zero, well above the boiling point of water, to some 150 degrees below zero, far below the coldest temperatures recorded on Earth. And it's constantly seared by radiation from the sun. The surface of the moon may be divided into the heavily cratered highlands, which Galileo called the brighter parts, and the maria, which Galileo called the darker parts. The highlands are far more rugged, having 20 to 30 times more craters than the maria. This means that the formation of craters had slowed drastically by the time the maria basins were filled. In essence, the highlands were formed when the moon was a growing dynamic body, the maria, when the moon was far less active. Until about a decade ago, our understanding of the moon was really limited to the information we could obtain through telescopes located here on the Earth. 
We really couldn't get a piece of the moon or touch its surface. Well, in a way, in the 1940s, we really did touch the surface of the moon by sending radar beams and bouncing them off the moon and picking them up again, reflected back here on the Earth. But it was going to the moon that was the important thing if we were really going to figure out what kind of world the moon is. And our first attempts to do that were a space probe package sent to the moon called Ranger. And after a series of rangers crashed upon the moon's surface, we succeeded in landing a space probe softly on that surface to photograph the landscape from the ground on the moon rather than coming in for impact. The surveyor then gave us a close look at what it might be like to walk the moon's surface were we really to be there in person. And that time eventually came too in the Apollo program. we had learned and discovered with unmanned space vehicles which landed on the surface and manned Apollo vehicles which orbited above the surface, the moon still seemed remote and inaccessible. Until that day in July 1969. been the stuff of impossible dreams completely disappeared and a new moon of mountains valleys and stone and dirt took its place now we'll get to the details of uh of what's around here but it looks like a collection of just about every variety of shape angularity granularity but every variety of rock you could uh, find fairly large number of uh, craters of the uh, five to 50 foot variety, and uh, some ridges, uh, small 20, 30 feet high, I would guess, and uh, literally thousands of little one and two foot uh, craters around the area. Uh, there is a hill in view uh, just about uh, on the ground track uh, ahead of it. Difficult to estimate, but might be uh, a half a mile. The goals of the uh, Apollo program were not just to get a man on the moon, of course that was one of the major goals, sort of an exploratory uh, program, but also to find out just what the moon is all about. How was the moon made? Uh, what was its origin? What was its history? What processes has it been through in the last four and a half billion years? Uh, what formed the craters, the light areas, the dark areas, and so on? 
prior to the space program of NASA and the Russians as well, we didn't know too much about the moon. Even with our very best telescopes, the smallest objects we could see on the surface were of the order of, say, a mile across or a little smaller. And anything smaller was completely invisible. Surface is fine and powdery. I can pick it up loosely with my toe. It does adhere in fine layers, like uh, powdered charcoal, to the uh, sole and inside of my boot. I only go in a uh, small fraction of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch, but I can see the footprints of my uh, boots and the treads in the fine sandy particles. The moon is an atmosphere-free or virtually atmosphere-free planet. It's a pretty good, it's in a pretty good vacuum chamber. The materials which are brought back from the moon reflect the absence of a present atmosphere and, as was discovered, the absence of a past atmosphere. And the materials which were brought back are really comprised of about three or four basic types. Some of them are lavas, which were made by the melting of material in the interior of the moon, which flowed out onto the surface of the moon. And, uh, I suppose all of the black splotches that we see when we look out of our window at night on a smogless, clear night. The, these are lavas and are analogous to terrestrial lavas, which flow uh, with very low viscosity, so they cover enormous areas, very, very large areas, maybe thousands of square miles, hundreds of thousands of square miles, maybe very thin, just a, f a few meters thick. In addition to these lavas, one sees in what are called the highlands of the moon much more ancient rocks which formed, as far as we know, the old crust that made the moon. Then you have what's called the regolith, or what some of us like to call moon dirt, which is the ground-up rock, which is all of these things mixed together by the result of impacting bodies. So the pockmarked surface of the moon that we look at, which is for the most part absent on the Earth, because the Earth has an atmosphere. There's water and it rains and it snows and it washes all the stuff away. The erosional processes on the moon are governed by impact and the implantation of charged particles in the sun. So what we then look at are volcanic effusive rocks that poured out old rocks which made up the crust of the moon and rocks which were excavated by enormous impacts uh, uh, several hundred making holes several several hundred miles across and the later modification of these rocks in the uh, stirred up effects of other debris falling in hitting it and splashing things out and mixing it up and, and some soils or ground up rock which is produced in that. Those are the basic materials. With the Apollo program, a new chapter in the history of science was begun. Simultaneously, a carefully planned and highly complex program of scientific investigation was set in motion. There would be new information about the internal structure of the moon, the chemical composition of the rocks and soil, the dynamic processes at work, and the ages of the materials. Among the scientists, the excitement was electric. The highest priority was for the astronauts to collect a selection of samples of the lunar surface, the first extraterrestrial material ever to be returned to the Earth from a known celestial object. The most important thing that we learned from Apollo had to do with the dimension of time, the history of the moon. We could look at the moon through the telescope and work out the stratigraphy of the surface, that is the succession of layers of material, the age relationships of one crater to another. 
but without actually going and bringing samples back, it was not possible to directly date the events that have transpired in the history of the moon. We can make some guesses, perhaps even some reasonably well-informed guesses, but bringing the samples back gave us the actual points of time in the sequence of lunar events. And what we learned from Apollo was that the rocks and the features on the lunar surface are for the most part extremely old. Most of the features on the moon are older than all but the very oldest rocks that have been discovered on the Earth. And what that means is the moon is a special place, for it preserves on its surface a record of events in the Earth's neighborhood that has been lost on the Earth, completely erased by subsequent geological processes on the Earth, but is preserved on the moon. In particular, that record extends from a time period of about four billion years ago to about three billion years ago. We now understand that record in great detail. There's still a period of time, we know that the moon is older than four billion years. We know that the moon is about 4.6 billion years old, and it's the same age as the Earth, and the same age as many meteorites that come from smaller bodies in the solar system and land on the Earth. Uh, so that's the age of the solar system, approximately 4.6 billion years. If we go backward in time, between about 3 billion years ago and 4 billion years ago, we find that the frequency with which craters were being formed by of other small bodies in the solar system was increasing as you go back in time. It increased very rapidly as one approaches the point in time 4 billion years ago. In fact, one can project that backward to the beginning, to 4.6, and say, ah, yes, what we see in the preserved record that we now understand is just the tail end of a very profound process by which many small bodies were falling together and were forming planets. So it appears as though what we see between 4 billion and 3 billion years ago is the end stage of material falling together to make the Earth and the other terrestrial planets. And just, it's just a piece of good fortune that that history has been preserved on the moon's surface. From instruments landed on the moon, scientists are harvesting a wealth of new information on the magnetic fields of the moon and of the Earth, the extremely thin atmosphere, the rate at which particles stream away from the sun. For years to come, scientists will be piecing together the lunar puzzle, searching out the answers to a long list of questions. But already, major sections of the entire puzzle are beginning to take shape. And the moon is by far a more interesting and complex body than ever anticipated. Structurally, compared to the Earth, the moon is extremely strong and rigid, as it would have to be to support the great mass concentrations or mass cons so near the surface. Scientists have learned that intense heating has played a major role in shaping the lunar surface. In fact, the Maria basins were filled with a lava flow. They have also learned that impact has played a major role, both on a gigantic scale and on a microscopic scale. Contrary to what many expected, there has been no evidence of water, and as most expect, there has been no trace of life, and there seems little chance of finding any. But as often happens in science, the current investigations have raised more questions than they have answered. What is the interior of the moon like? What is the source of the heat that produced the lava? Was it produced in the interior of the moon, or was it generated by meteoroid impact? What causes the side of the moon with most of the Maria basins to face us on Earth? What in detail are the relative differences between the highlands, the Maria? And finally, how was the moon created? Well, there are basically three theories of the origin of the moon, or three categories of theories. The first 
uh, is a, a fission theory which uh, with variations holds that the moon somehow broke off from the earth during or shortly after the, the growth of the earth the second is that the moon formed simultaneously with the earth in orbit about the earth out of similar matter uh, as the earth was growing in the solar nebula and the third theory is the capture theory that maintains that the earth formed and the moon formed in separate parts of the solar system and through some gravitational or tidal interaction uh, became bound together as a satellite system. So the three hypotheses I favor is a binary accretion, probably for the reason that I uh, am a physicist rather than a chemist, and I think the other two theories are motivated on chemical grounds. That is, their primary objective is to explain this chemical difference between the Earth and the moon. Whereas the third theory, the binary accretion theory, uh, falls out very naturally from the physics of planetary formation as we understand it. Uh, the Newton's laws are very few and very straightforward, and it's much more difficult to suspend these laws in order to make the moon than it is all of the myriad of possibilities that chemistry allows. In terms of the binary accretion theory, the moon must have originated as a tiny body and grew by a process of accumulating objects drawn together, often in massive collisions by gravitational attraction. These objects range from microscopic dust particles to asteroids. By 4.6 billion years ago, the moon had reached its present dimensions. During the last 10 to 100,000 years of this primeval bombardment, the collisions may have generated so much heat that the entire outer shell of the moon may have turned into a seething global ocean of molten silicate material. Once the bombardment slowed, the liquid shell began to cool, solidifying over a period of tens of millions of years. Crystals rich in calcium and aluminum form. They rose to the surface and produced a mush, which eventually solidified to become the dominant light-colored material we call the highlands. Simultaneously, dense crystals rich in magnesium and iron formed and sank to the bottom, becoming a distinct dense layer. There was now a lunar crust, a product of millions of years of crystallization. 100 to 300 million years later, radioactive heating became extensive enough to melt materials in the shell just beneath the crust. The melting produced pockets of liquid, giving rise to volcanic eruptions 4.4 to 4.3 billion years ago. At the same time, it seems that globules of molten material rich in metallic iron may have accumulated and settled down to the center to form a core. If two to three percent of the original moon consisted of metallic iron, the core could have a radius about one-fifth that of the whole globe. This differentiated moon with a crust, a mantle, and a core came as a surprise to many scientists who had expected the moon to be homogenous, with materials distributed more or less evenly throughout. A molten core rich in iron could have functioned as a huge dynamo, much like the Earth's core, and produced a magnetic field in the moon's distant past. This would explain the magnetic properties of many of the lunar rocks which have been returned by Apollo crews. According to theoretical studies, the Moon and Earth would have served as very efficient celestial vacuum cleaners, and within less than 100 million years after their formation, they should have swept up most objects in their vicinity. Surprisingly, 600 million years after the formation, or one half billion years later than we would have expected, huge objects were still striking the Moon to produce the rugged surface. Some of them were as large as the state of Rhode Island. The final ones blasted out the great circular basins we see on the moon's face today. 
one of the final large impacts, which we call the Imbrium event, produced the circular feature which now serves as the right eye of the man in the moon. By the time of the Imbrium impact, the exterior of the moon had cooled two depths well below the crust. The interior, by contrast, began to warm up, a result of natural radioactivity. At a depth of 150 miles, perhaps 300 miles, a zone began to melt, producing liquid silicate materials that accumulated in pockets. The liquids then worked their way to the surface, sometimes following fractures in the crust sometimes forcing a passage through solid layers. One volcanic flow after another filled in the great basins produced by the large meteoroid impacts and became what Galileo Galilei called the lunar maria, or seas. After some one and a half billion years, major volcanic activity on the moon had come to an end, except for a last volcanic gas originating deep in the lunar interior. Rare meteoroid impacts, such as the one which produced the crater Copernicus, and occasional small moon quakes. The peace of the moon has been largely undisturbed for 3,000 million years. Exploring the moon is only the first step of an exciting scientific journey. Today, the basic strategies are understood, and we're more certain of which scientific questions should be asked in our quest to understand the solar system itself. <laughs>